All right, uh, I got a few people here. Uh, Dr. Mabe, go ahead and get started. Um, let me know if uh, um, there's any audio problems or anything. Um, for, for anybody in the future, also let me know if I forget to start recording. I think we're recording now. Um, so the, our first Monday session last time, I didn't really have a good recording, so I didn't post anything. But uh, like I said in my announcement, um, I will go ahead and uh, post this and then certainly try and post all the future ones. We'll make a, a class playlist. They say I haven't made that yet. So, um, I mean, I've got lots of kinds of stuff that um, I thought I would go over, you know, but um, if, if the people who are live here, if you have any questions, I'm sure if you have a question about something or if you have a request uh, about something in particular, that you want to go over, you know, just uh, let me know here, and um, I can, I can um, kind of do whatever people have on their minds here, at least who are alive. So, sorry to do this on kind of a Labor Day um, day, but uh, but yeah, this class since it meets only once a week. I thought I'd want to have at least something here, especially since we have our first assignment. So, so. Um, I definitely wanted to talk about the first assignment um, and also talk about um, all of the materials um, about Python and about the NumPy and the SciPy and things like that. that. That was kind of at the top of my mind. So um, I thought I'd go over the Python stuff first um, and, uh, and then uh, NumPy and SciPy and then uh, Make certain I leave some time to bring up the assignment, see if people have any questions about the uh, first assignment, which is due on Friday. So I've gotten a few people look like they've gotten their dev box up. Um, I don't think everybody has um, given me their status as I requested all the way back last Friday. So hopefully everybody has their dev box up here. I, th I thought I'd start by showing a few things of using Jupyter Hub uh, to begin with. I have some of this things I'm going to talk about. I mean, all, all this stuff, you know, for more details, if you haven't started, you know, watching the videos that I had posted, uh, I'll have more details. Yeah, somebody's asking a question here. Um, but yeah, if you have a question, go ahead and just shout out. Uh, but um, most more of the stuff, um, I mean, there's going to be a lot more details than I'll talk about here in, in the videos for the, uh, the, the unit one and the unit two. So. So I just have to pick and choose about stuff we can talk about here. So. All right, but yeah, if you're definitely, if, if, if you don't have your dev box up, you really need to let me know. So um, um, I found some additional issues um, that people are running into. So, you know, if you're, um, so, so I think my, my fix for the dev box should work, but um, a few people, I don't know if this is Windows only, but if, if you, when you do your vagrant up now with the new dev box that I posted um, and you're getting an error um, about mounting shared folders and, and this particular message about mounting the VBox SF, for some reason you do have to install the, the VB guest additions by hand. So there's something with the current version of Vagrant or something somewhere, it's a bit off. You shouldn't normally have to do this, but but yeah, most everybody, if, if you do these steps, if you have that error, fixes that, so. There's one other issue that I'm aware of that I'm working on with somebody, so. But I know a couple of people have successfully got it up. Um, let me go and start my, my dev box. So I'm in my, you know, so to start, your dev box, you should always use the Vagrant command line. So don't use the um, VirtualBox GUI, right? So, you know, there is a, a VirtualBox GUI. Um, well, I've actually got another dev box running here. I should stop that. But, but uh, things that are managed by, by Vagrant, um, you shouldn't start and stop them from VirtualBox GUI. You need to, to manage them from the command line. Um, so I'm in a subdirectory called boxes. So if you follow my directions, uh, you're probably in a in your home directory in a subdirectory called repos instead of boxes. But same thing. So so you know, from how, wherever you are when you initially open up a terminal, you need to get into that directory where you installed your uh, dev box and just do the bigger up again. Okay. All right. And as I said in my notes, it's also a good idea that you know when you're done working for the day. Um, you should go back to your terminal and do a vagrant halt 
to cleanly shut down. So that's like turning the, that, that, that's like doing a, a clean shutdown on a physical machine, doing the vagrant halt from here, you know? So usually, you know, if you just reboot your system or shut down your, your host system, normally it won't cause um, a problem, but you know, it can just, just like, you know, just losing the power on your physical system you can occasionally cause a problem to, you know, your, your hard disk might get corrupted or something like that. So, so it's, it's a, again, you know, it's when this is running and you're done for the day, it's, it's a good idea to do a bigger halt to cleanly shut it down, right? So I had brought it up there. So a, a clean um, bringing up, and I'm gonna do it again here to bring it back up, reboot my machine. So a clean um, up, Couple of things to look for. You want to see that these port 8000 is being forwarded. So that's where your Jupyter Hub server um, is going to be available locally. So basically, this is saying that um, the, the guest, the dev box, which is the, the virtual machine, is forwarding port 8000. Um, so you can see it on port 8000 on the host machine, right? So that means if I open up a browser on my local host, go into to 127.0.0.1 port 8000, I should find my JupyterHub server if it's running, right? Another thing, um, you might want to check and make certain that the guest additions are correct, uh, you know, so it says that they're okay, or I guess you don't see anything, it just says checking for them, and if they're okay, it should be able to mount your um, shared folder here. So I might talk more about that later, although it's something that, um, actually, you do need this for this class, so I'll show why here when we talk about the assignment, all right? Uh, any questions from the um, from the live people? So let's see that it actually is running. So, so if it is running, you should be able to go to that 127.0.0.1 address, colon 8000, port 8000. And what you'll see is your Jupyter Hub. Um, so as I mentioned in the, um, the um, instructions for setting up your dev box, the user that we're using is, is has the username of Vagrant and the password is the same. There's not really any security issues with passwords and stuff since this virtual machine is running um, on your local host and it doesn't really have any network connectivity into it. So everything should be closed off except for this port 8000 being forwarded. And that should only be seeable on your local machine. So not outside to the rest of the world. So, so you should only be able to access it on your you know, on your home IP address, 127.0.0.1. So that should get you in here. So, so we're using um, Jupyter Hub, which is really nice. Um, and um, I thought I might start by showing a few features of Jupyter Hub real quickly here. Try to keep this to maybe 15 or 20 minutes here. So um, the things you can do, so you got a normal menu here um, with, with, with different things you can do. And along the side, you can get, uh, this is basically a file browser. Um, oh, and, and yeah, you can open and close your left side things. And there's also some right side stuff as well. This is a file browser. Um, I don't know, by, by default, where it opens you up at, um, so you might have to, to search around. So for the class, you should find that, um, you know, as, as part of creating the dev box, it downloaded all this stuff in our machine learning Python class repository here. So you should have the assignments, the data, the, the figures, all, all these, um, and the lecture notebooks and things. So in particular today, I'm gonna to kind of go over some of the lecture notebooks. So if you go on the lecture notebook, the, the, the lecture notebooks for unit one and unit two are all under the Python stack here. So I, I call it Python stack because these are things about using Python that you know you should have gotten to working, looking at last week. Uh, and then unit two here are all stat stuff about what I call the Python, what, what, what not just I call, but people call the, the scientific Python stack. So a bunch of libraries that are important for, um, if you have a question, let me know. So a um, bunch of libraries that are use, used 
extensively for machine learning and data analytics and statistics and scientific computing. So the main ones of those are the ones you're supposed to be, you know, learning the basics of this week. NumPy, Matplotlib, uh, Pandas, um, Seaborn is kind of optional, but we'll probably, you'll see me use Seaborn a bit in this class as well. And then next week we'll get into using Scikit-Learn, which is the machine learning um, library, basically, that we're going to be using mostly in this class. So. All right. So the other tabs over here, um, you've got things to manage your Python kernels that are running. Um, so maybe I'll come back and show that. Um, um, you've got, um, I should have extensions set up, so you should be able to see a table of contents. So we'll see that. Um, and, and I should, if everything worked correctly when you installed your dev box, you should find that you've got a couple of extensions installed the collapsible headings um, and um, the matplotlib extensions and this uh, Jupyter Lab Manager, which some of these have to do with this table of contents and some other things, some plotting extensions. So let's try opening up um, a notebook. So this was the first of the three for our first week last week. All right. So when you open up a notebook, it starts what's known as a, um, a, a Python kernel. So by default, it should be using the Python 3 uh, data science kernel, which I installed and set up as part of setting up your dev box. All right. So, um, as a hint, um, so, so one very basic things, um, like for example, when you're working on your assignments, your assignments are going to be done in Python, um, you know, Jupyter notebooks as well, just like these notebooks that we also use for the lectures, right? So a, a notebook, kind of one, one best practice sort of idea is that notebooks should be runnable, all cells should be runnable from top to bottom uh, when you're creating a notebook like this. So you can do, you can use um, like a kernel, um, um, restart kernel and run all cells, right? Uh, to, re to, to, to actually run all these cells if you want to, or just restart the kernel and not run anything. But I'm gonna go ahead and restart the kernel and run all cells. You can also do the same thing. So this button should, re should do that menu option. So like the fast forward, what I normally think of as the fast forward, uh, should restart your kernel and rerun the whole notebook, right? So what you'll see, so notice the star means that it's working on running the cell and now it's actually running these cells. Uh, it should end up running all of these if the notebook is correct all the way down to the last 106th um, cell that it ran. So that, that's the running kernel. So I briefly um, um, mentioned uh, that there, right? So, so every notebook that you have open has a Python kernel, which is basically a Python interpreter running it uh, behind the scenes so, it, so that uh, you can run these cells um, uh, using the kernel here. So, you know, uh, if I open up a second notebook, I would have a second kernel running. So if I open up the uh, one, two, um, unit one, second notebook um, on the Python programming data structures and classes. Now we would see that we now have a kernel for each, right? And if you want to over here, you can you can uh, shut down a particular kernel by, uh, what is it, like right clicking on, um, uh, by Xing over here, we'll shut down the kernel, or you can shut them all down. Um, so if, if you don't have a kernel running for your notebook, uh, you'll see that there's no kernel down here and you'll have to start one um, um, or, or you know, restart and rerun all the cells, okay? I'm gonna restart the kernel, but not run the cells this time. So I'm just gonna restart the kernel. Um, so now I've got a running Python kernel here that, so I can, um, I wanna restart the kernel and clear out all the shell. Um, um, And I'm going to restart the kernel and clear out all the outputs. So. All right. Oops. So um, I don't know. Some, some. I mean, there's lots of other features of Jupyter Hub here. I mean, Jupyter Hub is kind of a, basically a full-blown uh, IDE integrated development environment for doing um, 
uh, work with, with different things. So you can also get um, just plain text editors. Um, um, so that edit files and things. Um, um, So I'm trying to remember. Uh, so you have to have this launcher. I mean, there's different ways you can open these things up. So I'm gonna just quickly kind of show some of these. I mean, you can get a terminal. So um, I don't normally teach you how to secure shell into your virtual machine, although you can do it, but you don't normally have to. But um, you know, if you've got your virtual machine running, you can actually get into it using bigger SSH to get um, a command line uh, interface. Um, in your virtual box, your, your dev box, right? But you can get um, the same command line by opening up, um, by launching a terminal. This is a regular bash terminal. Sometimes we might have to drop to a terminal to do a few things, but probably not a lot in this class. So. All right, um, I use contextual help a lot. Um, so um, I often, you'll maybe see me running notebooks off and keep contextual help open up on the right hand side. So, I mean, it kind of does what it says. So uh, when you're doing stuff in these cells, it'll kind of parse the, the things in the cell and try and give you the documentation. Like if you're work, you know, if you, if you're in the context of like a, a Python function or, or whatever. Um, try and pull up the documentation for you. So notice that um, 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 the um, IDE is a kind of a, a pained. So, so this part here, you've got like a left and a right area, um, but in the middle, you've got a, a pained um, editing area, Oops. Um, right? So, so I can, you know, so at this moment, I've opened up my help, but put it down here. Um, on the bottom uh, and, and my editing tabs on the top here. But if I wanted to, um, I could uh, split them like this, or I can maybe, uh, I often do my stuff side by side. So I could bring it over here, you know, and, and, and have one, one Jupyter notebook over here on my right pane and one over the left pane, um, and so on. Right. I'll bring that back over here. Uh, and like I said, um, I often like the using the feature of the um, the outline kind of thing. So, um, um, so this, is, this is kind of a handy way to kind of navigate and keep your place in here. As long as you uh, do the, as long as you use the cells in the notebook um, the way that they're meant to be used. So I'm going to talk about that here next. So. Any quick questions about that so far? I don't remember if I had like a good basic tutorial just on using Jupyter Hub notebook. There, there's uh, on our class site, um, there is this additional resources. Um, there's some links in there. I should probably check and see um, if I've got other stuff in here. So. So yeah, I might see if I can try and find just a general uh, on some of a, a general tutorial on using kind of the features of the Jupyter Hub uh, IDE. Uh, I probably have some links somewhere to that. So. All right, so um, let's get back and, and look. Just let, let me just kind of do the basics of a of, because uh, we'll be doing most of our stuff in these. Um, Jupyter Lab notebooks, all right? So these are what are known as like a cell programming environment. So, so these are, um, uh, there, there's a couple of, of, of IDEs, or a couple of, of environments that um, kind of preceded Jupyter Lab that, that it sort of takes its design elements for the sort of cell notebooks from. So um, Mathematica and MATLAB had environments like this, right? 
So these are useful for certain kinds of work. So they're very useful for sort of prototyping and they're also useful for education. So the, these sort of cell notebooks can work as sort of um, like a literate programming. So, so you can um, you can make documents that also have live runnable code in them. So, so they're very useful for documenting things or creating uh, things that are really meant for learning or education, that kind of stuff. So, so there, there's really kind of two basic cells that we'll use. There, there, there's, there's, there's three cells. There's a raw cell, a code cell, and a markdown cell. Um, and I don't know if the dash is something else. Um, but uh, we won't really be using raw cells too much. So, so it's, uh, you know, you mostly gonna have to know about um, um, markdown cells and code cells. Okay. So code cells are the most obvious. So these have Python code. If you're in a code cell, um, you can edit it. So you can add text and things. If you want to execute the cell, I mean, you can hit this to run the selected cell. So you can tell which cell is selected by the highlighting on the left side here. So if I'm in the cell or if I have it selected, if I hit that, it'll actually run the cell. So this just imported something when I ran the cell. Um, I often uh, use keyboard shortcuts. So if you hit um, control enter, so control enter or shift enter, if you hit control enter, it'll run the cell, but leave your editor in the cell, I think. So we'll rerun the cell, or and if you hit shift enter, it'll run the cell and then move you, move your focus to the next cell, basically. Um, if, you, if you want to find all the keyboard shortcuts, um, I believe they're on. Um, somewhere on the help. Or is it? Um, so, I mean, there, there's a way that you can actually bring up, which is useful, um, you know, to learn at least some of the keyboard shortcuts for tasks that you do all the time. Um, but um, I'm drawing a blank on where that is at the moment. Um, you maybe? All right, well, I'll come back to that. So uh, I'll have to remember where to find that. I guess we can Google it. So. Um, but uh, let's come back to that. So uh, you know, I'll probably mention some keyboard shortcuts as I am, as I use them or do them here. So, um, so yeah, I, I often use Shift Enter to to run a cell. Um, so for a code cell, when we run a cell, and, and Control Enter, like I said, also I use it leaves you um, kind of leaves your focus on the cell. So, although I got it, left it so you can edit. Oh, um, so if you have the cell selected, but you're not in the editor, if you hit enter, uh, it'll go back into editing mode. So this is kind of like a modal sort of thing. So you can be, um, just have the cell selected, but not editing or, um, and, and if you learn, so, so um, again, it, it, if you really get into using these, so, um, you know, you can use like the arrow keys to move up and down through cells. Um, and, and then there's lots of keyboard shortcuts, like if you want to select the cell, move it up and down and things like that, um, which, um, you know, at times I really get into using those. So, so it's good, you know, to kind of avoid changing over using your mouse um, and, and, and really get um, efficient at using things if you can stay on your keyboard a lot. So, um, but, but yeah, anyway, so, you know, if you have the thing selected, if you hit enter, you'll actually go in to edit it. Um, and then control enter will actually run it, but leave it selected so I can hit enter again to go back and edit it some more. So, um, so for a code cell, you can enter any valid Python. 
the like create a variable that holds a, a value x. Um, Um, have another print statement, and then um, control enter it to run it. Right, so, so any by any valid Python can go in these um, cells here. Okay. And uh, if I'm running sequential cells by hand, then I usually use shift enter, so it, it'll go to the next cell. So I can like shift enter to run that one, and that one, and that one, and doing shift enter on a text cell just goes to the next one, don't really do anything. So. But I'm just executing all these. Um, and then let me briefly talk about these markdown cells. Um, so I will be insisting um, that um, for your assignments, there might be some parts of the assignment where you actually have to give me a written response answer instead of writing code, right? So in that case, you'll use a markdown cell. So a markdown cell uses a mark uses this uh, markdown language all right so again i should probably have a reference uh for that for, for people to to, to oh there, there's a markdown reference oh there's there's some nice jupiter there are some references in here so i don't know where the keyboard shortcuts is but um um there's here's a reference for the, the different kinds of markdown things you can do so the basics of that are things like um, a, a pound gives you a level one header, and that's what gives you the outline for you know um, uh, headers, sub subheadings, subsections, and sub subsections, and so on and so forth like that. So you know I can have um, level one heading. So this is a subheading with two pounds. So this is like you know making a book or making an outline, and then you should try and keep things organized um, um, well there. So um, but the, I mean this is a market language that most the, the, the market language most people have run across if, if none other is HTML of course. That's the hypertext markup language. So in HTML you have similar tags for for, for example for defining you know level one, level two, level three headings. These kinds of things. I'm not certain if how far you can go. I think I mean, you know, I think you can go down to 10, 11 levels if you if you really want to. Uh, anyway, so, so I probably, you know, but, but I should probably let you discover all these things and uh, more well, most of those on your own, you know. So but you know, always use a markdown cell if you're writing text. So you know, don't don't use a don't use a code cell. So I'm creating a new code cell different ways. So I can hit like plus. Uh, there's a keyboard shortcut for creating a cell. And um, you know, if I want a markdown cell, I set the type to be markdown. And if I want a code cell, you know, I, I, I can I can change the type from code to markdown or vice versa. Right. But never use a code cell and like comments um, write written text. You know, I should be using a markdown cell if, I, if I'm actually asking you to write uh, an explanation or, or you know, um, um, write an answer to a question. So this is my answer to question, but I've used a code cell and Python comments. Uh, which is a no, no for written responses, right? Oh, anyway, so you should use a code cell. Um, so, you know, so add any text I want. Paragraphs are separated by blank space. So, um, oh, and, and you know, so notice I'm in the editing mode here. So again, if I hit shift enter, it will render it. It will render the markdown uh, instead of seeing the, the um, markdown notation. Right. So uh, dashes for bullet list. Um, 
Um, he was like one dot for numbered lists. All right. Um, you can use um, um, so so code blocks are pretty useful in this class. Um, I think so. You can use like three ticks for a code block. Uh, oh, yeah, I mean, you can get bold and italics and things like that. You can add in hyperlinks. Um, So, let me put example code using tick marks. So, if you render that, um, oh, um, part of the, the specification is you can specify what the language is of the example. So, if I specifically say it's a Python code block, um, it should. Um, um, you know, I use um, what do you call it, uh, the, the source code highlighting and uh, colorization and stuff. So. Then finally, I'll mention um, that, um, I mean, we will be using um, some, um, uh, you know, a medium amount of mathematical um, um, expressions as part when we get, when we dive deeper into uh, different things, you know, our, our different machine learning algorithms in this class. So you can use a uh, LaTeX markup language. Um, and so you can use uh, LaTeX as another um, um, markup language. Um, so um, these notebooks um, allow you to specify like a, a LaTeX a mathematical not notation. Um, Say the sum of x equals one to n of x squared, something like that. So, uh, I won't expect you to learn uh, LaTeX uh, math markup, um, um, but you know, it's just good to know that it's available. So it's, it's a nice kind of feature for. Uh, Computer scientists and, and, and scientists in general. So, so the, these Jupyter uh, notebooks, uh, so, so um, Jupyter notebooks are extensively used by data scientists, computer scientists, um, um, and, uh, you know, uh, scientists in general, and computational scientists in whatever discipline. Um, so, so, it's a good tool to learn the basics of and how to do stuff. Um, all right. Any questions on that? I mean, that's some of the big highlights of these Jupyter notebooks. Restart and rerun everything here. Um, when you do your assignments, you know, again, make certain you use markdown cells for written answers. Of course, code cells will be for your Python code that you're doing for the assignments. Make certain that all cells cleanly run from top to bottom. So if you restart and rerun the kernel, we should see that every cell runs. If I go all the way down to the end of your notebook, I should see that all cells ran from number one down to the last one and produce output. You didn't have an error that caused it to, to stop somewhere in the middle. So, right? Um, yeah, I'm not going to talk about other features. So there's 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 lots of other features um, that we might see examples of um, later on, you know, or you know that, that we'll see and that you'll learn about just from using these notebooks and things. All right. So oh, so questions on that, or did I have anybody want to ask a question about DevBox setup or anything? The, I have quite a few people now that have joined live, or, or you know, it's almost 10 or so at, at this point. So, kind of my agenda, um, you know, I, I thought I would um, 
see if anybody wanted to talk about the um, um, first three notebooks, which were supposed to be for unit one, which was supposed to be an introduction to Python programming in general. So I'm from, you know, very uh, basic things, you know, variables and loops and, and functions and things to some more um, advanced things, okay? So um, in particular, I mean, it will be useful to understand object-oriented programming and functional programming because uh, both of those kind of come up. So um, uh, in particular, kind of like, like NumPy uh, and a lot of the libraries are object-oriented in most senses. Um, but uh, other libraries that we use have some functional programming kinds of aspects to them. So in particular, scikit-learn is structured to use um, uh, functional programming methods to, uh, to, to basically build fil data filters is the most prominent way that we'll be using um, some of those aspects of scikit-learn. So I can mention just um, you know kind of the um, the basics of these these first three notebooks and see if anybody kind of had a question or wanted to, to ask about things. So you know, like I said, all the way from um, uh, defining variables and doing the basic operations. So again, I basically am assuming that you know that you haven't necessarily done Python, but you have done some programming in some language, um, and especially if you've done, uh, so, so lots of languages um, kind of have lots of inspiration from C and C syntax. So that includes, you know, C, Java, uh, and Python, I would include kind of in that group. So a lot of the stuff, I mean, there will be some syntactic differences, but a lot of the stuff will be uh, familiar for anybody that's programmed in. C or Java or um, what, some other languages that some people might have used. So maybe Rust nowadays, things like that. Um, although, of course, there are differences. So Python is a interpreted language. So instead of compiling into an executable, uh, I mean, that's one reason why there's this kernel running because basically whenever you're executing a cell, um, it's interpreting the, 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 the Python code in that cell in, at run, in real time. So, so it basically sends the code in the cell to the kernel, which interprets it and executes it and prints out, returns back the result, um, and we display the result of running the cell there. Right? Another big difference for Python um, from compiled languages that, that some people might be more familiar with is that um, uh, it is not a strongly typed language. So, so you can declare variables, but you don't have to declare the type up front, right? So, so when I kind of modified this cell, I, I declared variables X and Y, um, and I assigned them a value, but I didn't have to say that these were integer variables or floating point variables or something like that, as you might be familiar with in some other programming languages, right? Um, but you can write, expressions and, and the, the set of operators for arithmetic expressions is going to be pretty much the same um, as most of the languages I've mentioned. Um, there is a there is an operator for raising values to a power in Python which C doesn't have but which I can't remember if Java has one of those or not. Although um, uh, so some languages use the up caret, or I don't know, whatever you call that, kind of that up arrow for raising to a power, but that is actually not raising to a power. That, that's used for a different operation. So if you use that to thinking that it'll raise to a power, um, uh, you'll get an unexpected result. It's actually doing a bitwise operation, right? Um, so um, actually C, uh, and, and, and that, that's the same as in C, so, so in C, um, you use that, I believe, for an XOR, but you use like a, a single bar for doing a bitwise OR and a single ampersand for do, doing a bitwise uh, AND, right? And, and, and um, that's what the up arrow there, that's another bitwise operator, which I won't talk about. So anyway, uh, we'll much more be using needing to raise things to a power. So we'll use the um, exponential 
exponentiation operator, and that's two stars in Python. To um, so if I, if I wanted to square six, I would say six star star two to, to raise six to the second power. But Python has the same usual order of evaluation. So it basically uses PEMDAS and, you know, you can, you can group things using parentheses, um, but otherwise, you know, it'll do multiplications and divisions. It'll actually do what? Exponential, uh, raising things to a power is kind of like the highest default um, order of operation, followed by parentheses, followed by multiplication and division, followed by addition and subtraction. Again, all this stuff is stuff that if this isn't ringing a bell, you know, you might want to go and review some things. Um, but I'm assuming that um, um, people have some familiarity with all this kinds of stuff in general from the mathematical perspective and in particular on some programming languages to do this kinds of thing. So I somehow have, let's be Zoom, I've got my, uh, I've got something um, so I can write on there. How do I turn that off? I don't know. Anyway. Um, Well, even though Python is not a strongly typed language, uh, I mean, really, all the variables you create do have a type uh, when you create them. It infers the type from the from when you initialize the variable. Um, so, you know, so and, and it infers the type from the format of the constants, right? So if you get something that kind of looks like an integer, it's going to um, uh, use an integer type for that. And these types will be the same um, as are available in C and Java, uh, things like that. Um, you now, so if you use like a decimal point, it'll infer that you want to use like a float or a double type. Python does have built in strings. Um, um, unlike C, which uses, uh, has, it, but it doesn't have like a single character type like C does. So, uh, and it actually uses both single quotes and double quotes for a string constant. So it doesn't matter whether you say, I mean, if you use double quotes to open, you do have to use double quotes to close, um, or that's an error. But you can use single quotes or double quotes to, to enclose a string, right? And there's no, there's no like, single character type as in like the C language and other languages. So if I do that with a single character, it's actually still a full string type instead of a single character. All right, um, and then, you know, Step around here a little bit since nobody's asking questions or wants anything clarified. So, um, it's important to make certain you know how to create functions in any programming language um, that you're using. Um, so, um, I mean, you know, print and type, we've already been using function, built-in functions, so print and type are actually functions, we're actually calling them, so when we do print, we, we pass in one or more parameters, so, so you can actually pass in a list of parameters to print. And then it will kind of concatenate them all together and print them out. Type will take a single parameter um, and it will do some introspection to determine what the data type is, and, and, and you can pass in also a variable for type, which there were some examples of that before. Oh, kind of an aside here, notice for these cells, um, um, when you do stuff like this, often you'll only get the, the last result. So um, if you wanna get multiple output, from these, like if I want to know the type for both of these, I do have to either put these in separate cells or you can print them out. So in that case, you'll get um, all of the output. Um, so, so this is the result. Uh, so, so the last 
result that happens in a cell is displayed as the result of the cell, but you also get any resulting output um, displayed on the standard output. Uh, um, when we do this stuff here. So, um, so this, this is actually printing out um, the, the output. So anyway, yeah, so, you know, type 42 return, uh, there was an integer type, and, and, and then this one for the type of batch return, that was a floating point type. Um, okay, but let's let's get to back to functions. So um, you'll be using a lot of, of library functions defined in standard Python libraries, but also defined in like NumPy library and SciPy library. So the basic way to use a function that somebody else has created is you first will import the library that you want to use, like import math statement here. And then once you have it imported, um, you'll use the dot operator. So this is like, a, this is, you know, again, originally from C for, for getting members of a structure. And so you see in Java and other languages use the same dot operator. So, so if I have like a library or some namespace, there's things inside that namespace. So I, I have, I actually have constants defined inside of the math namespace like pi and e that I can access. Um, or there's functions, so I can I can access like sine function, square root function, cosine function, log function, um, all in the math library. So math dot function, and then I call it like I normally call function. So the way you normally call functions is you pass in the parameters that it's expecting, right? So again, I got my help um, open up here. Um, so they're not so sometimes there's not a whole lot of of information, uh, not not a lot of good contextual help for like built in or or, or standard um, libraries like the math function. Here. So we're not getting a lot of help for like the sine function here. But um, but yeah, in this case, it's telling you that it's really just expecting a single parameter, uh, and then kind of the slash means. I guess the slash means that. Um, That, um, yeah, so, so I'm not certain what the slash means there. So, so normally these parameters only, you can only give it one parameter. These functions, you can only give one parameter. Um, so you pass in two, the parameter, and it tells you what the square root two is as the result, return result. Um, Um, and then I'll be jump. So besides using functions, you can of course define your own functions. So, um, so I've just a real quick example from this notebook. Um, uh, so here's a function. So to define a function in Python, uh, you use the def keyword. So that that means define a function. You give the name, and then you give the list of parameters. Um, right. So in this case, there's only a single parameter. Um, but um, um, you can you can have more than one parameter by um, having parameters that are passed into the function separated by commas. Again, this is pretty similar to most programming languages that I expect that people are, are familiar with. You have some way to define a, a function no matter what programming language you're used to. Usually functions can take zero or more parameters. So, so you know, if you want to have a function that um, um, I'm sure there's examples of a function with no parameters, but you can create functions with no input parameters. Um, they're usually not too useful functions, but you can do that. Or you can create functions with one parameter um, or with more than one parameter. Okay. And then uh, normally for this class, we're going to create fruitful functions that actually do something with the input and return a result. So. Like in this example, this is a very quick example, but um, um, if, if we want to have a function that computes the distance between two points on a Euclidean two-dimensional space, so, so point x1, y1, 
uh, the distance from that to uh, point uh, define at x2, y2. And you know, we can use um, the, um, the standard Euclidean distance formula, you know, x1 minus x2 squared plus y1 minus y2 squared. The square root of that gives you the distance between those two points. And then we return that as the result. So, um, um, oh, so in this case, we were given an example of using a, a function inside of a function, but, um, but um, so I could use this first function here if I wanted to, to find out the distance between these two points. So notice, um, I'll just point out here real quickly, notice I'm getting some contextual help that's what this, 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 these are known as the, the, uh, the, the Python doc string here, right? So everything after the declaration of the function that's between three opening double quotes to three closing double quotes um, is part of the function documentation, right? So that'll automatically be used in different areas. Uh, so for example, for the contextual help here, right? So I kind of have, um, I'm going to require you to always provide documentation, um, uh, Python doc strings here when you write functions for the assignments for this class. So at a minimum, you should do things like give a um, description of the function and then document the input parameters to the function x1, y1, x2, and y2 in this case, and document the return result or return value. But anyway, that, so that's why when I'm um, about to try and invoke the distance function, I get the contextual help for the distance function, which kind of tells me that um, you know, I, I'm supposed to be packing in two, four, four parameters here. So if I want to know the distance from 0 0.00, 0 to 0.55. Um, pass in those four parameters um, and presumably it's calculating the distance. Um, that point to that point. All right. Um, so I guess the only thing I kind of really skipped on this one was you know, like um, condition statements, um, so Boolean expressions. Again, the syntax should be pretty pretty similar to um, um, what people um, are used to here. Um, So I finally remember how to do that. That was a Zoom thing, those annotations. I, I think some people have been learning Zoom or figuring out Zoom. So uh, anyway, so um, um, conditional statements, uh, loops and things, uh, oh, well, if statements, if else statements. There is no like switch statement in Python. So you have to use if else uh, or if else if. So the keyword for else if is ELIF for a, a multi part condition statement. Um, the main kinds of iterations that we'll use in this class are, are uh, while loops, but um, um, I use a lot of uh, for loops. Talk about those um, other places here. So. All right, so those are the basics of Python. Um,
I'm switching over to the second notebook here, rerun everything. So, oh, by the way, a note. Um, so normally for these these sessions, whether we're doing them Zoom only or, or live, um, I normally take a break after uh, an hour um, for each one. So, so we're coming up on that. Although I think maybe I might stretch it a little bit here because uh, I'm just going to say a few things about Notebook 2 and maybe Notebook 3, just point out a few things. And then, then maybe we'll take a break and I'll come back and, 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 and see if there's questions and talk maybe a bit about NumPy and SciPy and stuff like that. So, or, or NumPy and Matplotlib and things from the Unit 2 notebooks. So. Um, so um, starting with the second notebook is where we get into things that will that, that will begin to be the most different from a language like C or Java that, in my experience, is the one that most people are familiar with if they haven't looked at Python um, before. So for Python and like R um, and uh, MATLAB um, are kind of much higher level than, than kind of your Java and your C and, and Rust and things. So, uh, so, so one of the big wins about that being, being higher level is that there's these, these much higher level sorts of um, data types um, that are available in the language. So, so there's a very powerful list type, which I think I'll, I'll, I'll jump right to and do a few things of that. And then there's these dictionaries. Um, so, you, so you really, if nothing else, um, ought to familiarize yourself with lists um, because when we get to NumPy arrays, they, are, they, they use some of the same syntax and ideas of, of lists. So list slicing and things. So. But also dictionaries is another one that you ought to make certain that you understand. So when, when people first start working with Python, uh, you might see a list and you might think it's kind of like an array and it is. So a list is a, um, a, mutable, a, a mutable sequence of items that you can index by an integer value. All right. So, um, so I kind of jumped right into, into this. So, you know, we, we, we've got a couple of lists defined here. Um, so, so all three. So you define a list by using square brackets. Um, so, so a list is not like an array in C uh, in many ways. So for one thing, you can actually put values of, of any data type in here. Um, so you know, so an array in like C and, and a basic array in Java has to be all the same types. So when you declare an array in C, you have to declare an array of integers, and all the values in the array are going to be integers. So, but when you have a list. I mean, the values can be you know, strings and integers and booleans and, and you can stuff anything you want. So another difference between arrays um, and lists, basic arrays and lists, is that arrays can grow and shrink. So I can, add, I can push items or insert items into lists pretty easily, whereas you can't really do that with basic arrays in C and Java. So here with these arrays, um, um, maybe I should have shown an example, a basic example. So they, they, they do allow you to index the items and they are they do use zero-based indexing like arrays in C and Java. So if I want the first item, my, my first item in stuff here, I can say stuff zero. Um, if I want the, the third item, that's, you know, the third item is that index two, since we begin at index zero, so zero, one, two. So you always have to keep in mind that we're using zero-based indexing, right? Uh, but then uh, there's more powerful ways of accessing items. Um, So for example, you can use a negative index. So in this case, for my list L, uh, I got, actually have a list inside of a list, right? So the last item of list L is actually another list with four values. So, so if I ask for L minus one, I get the, the last item. If I, and if I ask for L minus two, 
to get um, the second to last item. So in this case, though, uh, the reason why we're not getting what we expected is I probably modified this list later on. So if you ever see that, that's one um, thing you need to be aware of when working on a notebook. So if I modified this list later on, um, 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 that's what the current value of L is, but I can't quite see that because a cell that I executed later on here uh, modified the um, um, the value. So um, I often do, I, re, I often rerun my kernel, just run, run all the cells above the cell to get back to the state I was expecting. So, um, so, so I might restart my kernel and clear all outputs. And then, um, and then run um, all above the selected cell. So I know exactly where I'm at. So now at this point, because I just defined L, I should be able to get L minus two is what I was expecting now. So, so the second, second to last item should have been five. And then, then yeah, so you can you can slice items, so you can get more than one item though by using this this notation, a slice. So this gives me the items from one up to, but not including the item at index three. So that's just gonna be the items at index one and index two. Right. You can also use negative indexing for this. So I can get the items from one, so that excludes the item at index zero up to, but not including the um, last item. In that case, it's gonna be kind of the same thing here. So that gives me the item from one up to, but not including the last item. If I can get it up to, but not including the last two items. So. If you don't, if you don't, include like the beginning and it assumes you mean from zero so this is this is all but the last two items um, and likewise if you don't specify the last one so if i want all the items from two to the to, to, to all of them um, it'll assume that you want all the items to the end then if you don't specify an in index for the slice Um, and you can also specify like a step. So if I want all items, but uh, at every other index, so this will get me the item at index zero, two, four, six, eight, right? And I'm again, I'm, I'm leaving it to the default. So I'm getting all items from index zero to whatever the last item is, but every other item. So that should be zero, spam, uh, two, and that, that was it. So only, only the items at index zero and two in this case. So anyway, that, that was quickly, that was um, uh, lists and um, Slicing them, I guess that there's some more, there's even more stuff about slicing down here. Um, another thing, so this is, this is kind of a shame. Uh, it's becoming less true now that, that I run across students that don't really know what a map is or a dictionary is. Uh, you can get these in, uh, they are available in Java library. Um, they are not really something you can do in C, plain C, but C++, the standard template library has mappings and dictionaries and things. So dictionaries are very powerful high level data type. We'll use them all the time in this class. So, so, uh, so for a list, uh, every item in the list is indexed by an integer index. So the, the zeroth item, the first item, item in index one, item in index two. So for a dictionary or a mapping, we index the items by um, some arbitrary key. So, so, so dictionaries or maps are, are sets of key value pairs. 
where the, the first one in this case represents the key, how we index the item. And then the second represents the value. So, so the thing that's associated with that index. So, you know, we can often use, we often use just arbitrary strings for a dictionary. So in this case, if I index the Newton key, I get the value 1642. Right? But you can use other things for, for the, the, the key, for the index, um, for a dictionary. Um, I don't know if I had any other examples, but. Um, But yeah, so, so dictionaries are, are very um, powerful. So you should make sure you understand what a dictionary is, how to use it. So. Um, and then let me also mention tuples here because um, um, a tuple is really just a list, a Python list, but it's a it's an immutable list. So it's a list that you can't actually modify the values in it, right? Um, so, so as a basic example, so you use um, just the list of items separated by commas will, will be treated as a tuple. You can also use um, um, parentheses instead of square brackets around those. So both of those will give us a list, or will give us a tuple, right? So this will work exactly like a list except if you try to assign um, a value to the list here. So, so, if I, so, so these are immutable, so that means that I can't modify it. So, so if I try to change the value in my tuple at index zero to a different value, um, you'll get um, an error that um, um, it doesn't support item assignment here. Um, but the reason why it's kind of important to understand these is that we use tuples all the time uh, in our example code here. Um, so for one thing, um, in order to write functions that return multiple values, we will often return a couple of values. So here we've got a function that returns, if you give it some list of values as input, it'll return the minimum it finds in that list and the maximum it finds in that list. So it actually returns two values as a function, as a result of calling the min-max function. So again, if we, if we pass a list of all these values, um, it's returning a tuple. And, and what we do, so I, I, above this, I talked about item assignment. So, so if I wanted to, um, If I wanted to, I could save the tuple, um, the whole tuple in a new variable. I call it x here. All right. So now this is a this is a tuple. And if you look at it, we, we, we got the value. So you know, we, we got basically a tuple, a, a sequence of values, the minimum value one and the maximum value nine. Right. But we often use if we're returning a tuple. We often use this, this ability to assign the individual items of the tuple when we do the assignment. Um, um, so, so if a function is returning the tuple of values, I can directly assign the first value of the tuple into a new variable called min value, and the second value of the tuple into another value called max value. Um, and uh, print those out or whatever. All right, so I just wanted to point that out because you know we use that feature a lot, uh, and, and that's used a lot in the functions that we use in the libraries, um, you know, in, in NumPy and, and Matplotlib and things. So often you, you run across functions that are returning lots of values, um, and you might want to get the individual values extracted from that tuple um, parse them out. 
right. So that's um, kind of our, our data types and things. And then real quickly, um, Um, let me just mention one or two things then about um, um, doing object-oriented programming in Python and doing functional programming in Python. So um, you will, we will, there will be a couple of places where we'll need to understand the basics of defining classes um, and, and, and uh, doing things in an object-oriented way using Python. Um, so the way you define a class is use the class keyword, right? And then I'll just jump down to kind of a, a, a bigger example and talk about it. So um, so like here is a, is a relatively big kind of example of a class. So, so here um, is a class that's meant to represent a single two-dimensional point, all right? So you define uh, inside the class, you give it um, member methods. So, so these are methods that are uh, members of the point class. Um, there's some special methods that have the, the, the two underscores. So there's an init, which acts as the class constructor. If you've done object-oriented programming, um, and there's other special methods. So for example, you can, oh, you can define the add member method in order to overload the plus operator, right? And you can add member methods yourself. So all member methods of a class in Python have a first parameter, which is an instance of the point class that gets passed in when you call the member method, okay? And I, I discussed this um, in this notebook, if you're not too familiar with how object-oriented programming works. So the short of it is, like, if you look at how we use this, this point class, so point then, um, we can create instance of the point class. Um, and in this case, um, for example, the constructor method is expecting that you pass in the, the values for the X and the Y, um, and it will set the values of its um, private variable X and Y to be those values that you give it to the constructor. So I can create a point with the values three and four. Um, let's see if I can run this, this cell here. So um, I can create the values with, create a point P2 with the values three and four. And um, I can do things like print it out. So, so here, the, the, the special string method, if you try and print out an object, um, if it has a string method, um, it knows how to, that, that's what it uses to create a string and return a representation of the method. So in this case, we give them a more human readable representation of the current values of the method. Um, um, and so in this case, the, the second line here when we print out um, is from the point two, where it has an X value of three and a Y value of four. Um, and we can call um, the instance method. So again, I already talked about this, but um, um, so an instance of a, of a point method like P1 here defines a namespace. So I can call the methods that we define in our class, you know, like, like the distance method here is a regular method instead of one of these special methods to calculate the distance between this point and some other point, like point, um, point two. So the distance method is expecting um, another instance of a point to be passed in. Um, if you know anything about right triangles, the, the distance between a point at, at the origin zero, zero and a point at x3, y4 is gonna be the, the side of that three, four, five triangles so is going to have a distance of five. So that's all I'll say about 
about classes here. So you should read through the notebook here uh, with, with the basics of, of classes. Um, and uh, maybe the two most important things, uh, well, I've got two different sections here, but, but um, there's another style of programming that you may or may not have run into called functional programming. Um, and you can also do functional programming in Python. Um, and some of the libraries that we use work in a more of a functional programming way instead of an object-oriented um, programming way. So in particular, the, the scikit-learn has some parts of it that work kind of uh, uh, using functional programming um, concepts. Um, um, so one thing about functional programming is that functions are first-class objects. So basically, that means you can pass in functions to other functions. And, and we'll be using that um, in various places in this class, I think. Although we use this a lot more uh, in the deep learning class, kind of, that's a good um, companion. So it's sort of a, it's a good um, uh, class to take after this class. So. Um, so just as a quick example, if we create a function that tests um, a value to see if it's even or not. So this should return true if the value is divisible by two, so if it's even. Um, and it returns false if the value is an odd value. We can pass that function in other functions. Right? So the, the filter function here expects um, a function that takes a single value as input and returns a Boolean result, like is even here. Um, and then, what, then we pass a list. And so, so this other, this filter, this is an example of a filter function. It just iterates over all the values that you pass in as the second parameter. Um, and it uses the, the first function that you pass in as a test or as a filter here. And so any item that it finds is true, um, it's going to append to this resulting list and return that result. Okay. So, so, you know, so. The result of calling our filter um, using the is even function is we get a new list that only has the even values. Right? But again, you know, we're, we're passing in a function as the first parameter here. And we can do that because Python allows functions to be treated as first class citizens. They can pass in functions as parameters to other functions and use them inside of that function. So, you know, we can use the same filter, but create a different um, function to pass in. So is odd or two. So in this case, this function returns true um, if the value is a two or if the value is an, is an odd value. So when we run that function, we get all the odd values, but also values of, that are two in the list. Um, and then talking about filters, so the main way that we use kind of functional programming in the scikit-learn library is to create what are known as um, um, transformation filters, so, so map transform filters. So, so basically, you can chain together um, a sequence of filters where it expects a um, um, it expects something like a data frame as input, and it applies the filter to it, and, and it gives a data, data frame as the result. Um, so, so all of these filters um, for scikit-learn take, take, take data frames as input, uh, filter them on some criteria, and give a data frame as a result. Um, so that, that, there's a little bit about kind of the basics of that in the... Um, talking about uh, maps and filters uh, and pipelines here in this notebook. All right. Um, okay, any questions about that? So, so I went a little bit longer than I would normally want to kind of for the first section here. I want to take 10 minutes since it's 5.50 here. Um, take a little 10-minute break, although, you know, 
if anybody had like a wants to jump in with a quick quick question here, they can. So when we when we come back, I'm going to talk more about NumPy and SciPy and the uh, first assignment. All right, so let me pause the recording um, and um, uh, take a quick break. Please try and remind me to start the recording back up. Um, all right, um, I'm back. Um, and um, I'm going to go ahead and start again. I, I, I got the recording going again. I think I remembered to do that. Um, uh, let me remind people that, so, you know, I'm, I'm not going into detail on these things. I'll be happy to if, if anybody who's live here um, wants to ask some specific questions about things. Um, there are quite a bit more details on, you know, those notebooks that I just kind of went through real quickly. Um, um, in our unit one, so it's all three, each notebook um, has its own video, you know, so you all look for those for more um, information, more detailed discussion. Um, same for, you know, the, the three here that I'll talk about. Um, well, I might not spend quite as much time on these, but. Um, and if it's not clear, I mean, you know, you really should be not just watching the videos. You know, you ought to have your 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 dev box up, your Jupyter Hub server running, um, and and be running the notebooks, um, reading through them, and not only just reading, but but actually, you know, don't be afraid to to be making code changes. So you should be um, adding your own code, trying things out, you know, so that's a good way to make something you understand kind of the stuff that's being talked about there. So writing your own examples or modifying the uh, existing examples and, and, and trying different things out, you know, so but that's always a good way to answer a question is, is to, to make up something on the cell and run it and see, you know, what you get and if you understand um, what's being said there. So. Okay, let's close these off. So often, you know, so, so the the kernels when you run notebooks keep running, right? So even even if you close off the tab for the notebook, um, which is why they've got this tab to manage the um, uh, the kernels and open tabs and other things. So um, I often, you know, if, if if I really am done with with the tab, I go over here and get rid of them out of the kernels as well. So I don't have lots of kernels running in the background while I'm doing stuff. Although they, they really shouldn't be taking up any uh, that much resource if you're not actively executing, interpreting some code in the kernel. So um, Yeah, NumPy is a very important library. So, um, yeah, I mean, to really understand the, the scikit-learn kind of stuff that we do, um, you ought to get a good grasp on what NumPy and NumPy arrays are. So this is this is one in particular to pay attention to among the, the, the six kind of notebooks or, or six kind of videos that I had here for these first two units. So um, NumPy is an example of a library. Um, so we can import the whole namespace using the import statement. Uh, this is a convention that you'll see a lot working with um, 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 Python um, libraries is that uh, especially working with them in notebooks, that people always in, often import them as some as something, um, usually given a small name, right? So like a nickname. 
So we'll follow that convention. I, I, most people do for the nickname in order, order to save typing, you know. So I have kind of feelings about that, but uh, about, you know, I mean, isn't, maybe it's more readable just to keep the whole name. But um, anyway, so, so it's, it's pretty conventional to, be, to use an M, MP as like an alias for, for the NumPy library. So, so you'll probably run across lots of libraries or even our textbooks and things will be NP dot something if they're calling NumPy uh, library functions and things. So. So, so NumPy provides an array type so this array type in NumPy is more like a basic array in C or Java, okay? So, so, you, so you might ask why, so why? Why is NumPy so important? I mean, aren't, aren't, aren't lists, aren't the Python lists, didn't I just get saying, get done saying that they're more powerful, so, so they're higher level? Um, and, and that's true, you know, so, so the regular Python list, you know, you could, they, they're, um, you can add and remove stuff into them. They can hold values of different types. Um, arrays, NumPy arrays, by contrast, are immutable. So once you create the array, you can't really, um, I'm sorry, they, they, they are mutable. So you can change the values in there, but um, they are homogenous. So you can only have define arrays of a particular type. Um, you know, the, the, all, all the values in, in a NumPy array have to be of the same type. So if you create an array of integers, um, all the values are going to be integers in that array, in that NumPy array. They are um, immutable in the sense that uh, while you can modify the values in the array, um, you can't easily grow and shrink them. So, so if I need to remove some items from an array, what you do is you just create a new array of the new size that you want, and, and you copy the values from the old space to the new space. Okay. So why have NumPy arrays? Uh, the, the answer is performance. So by, by making NumPy arrays homogenous and uh, not really, and, and, and they're basically static. So that means that once you allocate uh, the array, you can't resize it without creating a new array in memory and then copying what you need from the old, old size one to the new size one, right? So by, by enforcing kind of those restrictions though, NumPy arrays, um, native NumPy arrays have very good performance for numerical calculations. Thus, the NumPy library is really kind of the, the base of the scientific Python library ecosystem. So almost all the important um, Python scientific uh, libraries are built on NumPy uh, arrays, all right? So that's why they're kind of important to, to understand the basics. Right? Um, so unlike plain arrays in C and Java, NumPy arrays easily support multi-dimensional arrays, okay? so. Uh, the, the, the way to do like a two-dimensional array in, in original C was a bit of a kludge. Um, and it got really, it gets really hard if you try to do more than two-dimensional arrays in like C. And, and I haven't used Java um, recently enough, um, but, but I think you kind of have the similar kinds of issues in Java for you know, if you need a three-dimensional array or, or higher dimensional than that. So, so NumPy arrays are homogenous and static, but they are built from the ground up to support high dimensional um, arrays, okay? So technically, um, you may, we, we'll run across the term here. Um, these are known as tensors in math, mathematics. So a tensor is really just a fancy, fancy name for a array that can have you know, multiple dimensions. So, so even a one-dimensional vector is technically a ten tensor, but we have a special name for that we call a vector. A two-dimensional array is, is often called a matrix in mathematics, um, but it's, it's a two-dimensional tensor. And then, you know, we don't have specialized names for higher, higher dimensional um, arrays in mathematics. So they go by the general name tensor, right? And, and, and you know, you, you might, have heard of the TensorFlow library. Um, so um, uh, that's where it kind of gets its name from. 
And so, so NumPy arrays are, are really uh, tensors that they, they support uh, one or two or many dimensional um, array representations. All right. So the easiest way to create an array. Um, so here's an example. Um, here I use a function to create uh, actually a one a vector. So a range in Python. So again, you know, I encourage you, you know, if you run across something you don't know what it's doing, you know, try it out. So generally most of the documentation for the built-in stuff for NumPy is much more detailed. Um, so you know, this, this is telling you it takes a start. Takes an optional start parameter, a stop parameter, an optional step size, um, and the, these are all named parameters. So basically, the only required parameter uh, and stop. So if you ask for uh, a range, you get a one dimensional array uh, with a range of values from zero up to the up to but not including the, the, the stop parameter, which was the only required parameter that I included here. So anyway, um, uh, so what I'm doing here is I, I take that and then I reshape it to be a two-dimensional array. So it has a shape of, of, of three rows by five columns. Right. So now, um, so after we did that, notice, so, so I, I, uh, I assign that result into an array called A. So A is two-dimensional. So it actually has, it's a two-dimensional, it's a matrix. Um, uh, in, a mathematician might call the matrix. Its shape is two dimensional, but but it has three rows. You know, so so telling you something that's two dimensional doesn't tell you everything. So I could have a two dimensional square matrix that has four rows and four columns, or like in this case, I could have a two dimensional matrix that's not square um, and, and it's three rows by five columns. Okay. By convention, we always put rows first, columns second for two dimensional. Um, uh, the shape and information for a two-dimensional matrix or a two-dimensional tensor. Um, size is just the total number of values. So there, there's 15 values in this array that uh, starts at value zero, goes up to 14. There's actually 15 slots or 15 um, items in this array. And all the, the data type of the array, all the array are, are integer numbers because by default a range returns an array of integers so it used uh, um, as the data type right? I don't know if the the int 64 throws people or not I, I guess maybe um, it does um, um, some people quite a few people so you know again if you've been using like a typed language like, like C or something you're familiar with basic data types like int and float and double so um, um, here at this level, this specifies a little bit more precisely the size in terms of the number of bits of a data type. So if you ever, ever see a data type with a type and then like a size, it's telling you the, the, the bit size. So you can have int 64, but you can also have like a double sized int. So you can have int 128, which is 128 bit sized int. Same things for, for float. So, so you can have like a, a float 32, which is a radio size float, or you can have a float 32, which is a, a double size float, sometimes called a double um, in languages like C and things. Um, item size is eight because we have 64 bits um, and each um, eight, eight is means eight bytes in this case. Uh, and each byte is eight bits. So it's going to be, this is always going to be the number of bits divided by eight will give you the item size. Um, and there, there's probably other information that you can get um, about, uh, about an umpire array. So, so like I said, I mean, you know, you can create um, three dimensional arrays, four dimensional arrays, even higher dimensional tensors. Um, Here's an example of a three-dimensional array. So um, in this case, you know, we don't have a good name for some of these things. And it's, 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 a lot of people think of this as, you know, the, the, the last two dimensions represent the row and columns. Um, you know, so we've got five row by four, uh, 
four rows by three column things. And then each one of these is a, is a separate slice or a separate like table. Um, so we've got like five tables for the, uh, the third dimension of this three dimensional array. Um, So array, um, NumPy arrays have lots of member functions. So again, if you have something that was created, you know, so basically this is like returning an object like I just talked about on the previous thing. So when you call uh, random uh, int here uh, in the NumPy library, it returns an array of shape three by six of random integers with values between one and six. And I think it's not inclusive. So in fact, you know, let me click on that so we can read the documentation for RAN it. So um, so I mean it's one above the largest integer to be drawn from that distribution. So not a real great description, but but by saying one above, it means it doesn't include six. So so the random value is going to be random integers from one up to and not including six, so one to five, which you can kind of see there. Um, and we asked for, uh, this actually told us, you know, not only the number of values, we wanted 18 values, but we wanted in a particular shape, three by six. So a lot of these array creation functions um, in NumPy take a shape parameter, uh, or it's, it's actually called size parameter usually um, in the documentation, which is what I've been calling the shape here, three by six, three rows by six columns. All right, but anyway, so that returns basically an instance of a NumPy array. And so like uh, instance, and so, so again, this is object-oriented programming here. So once you have an instance of an array object, um, NumPy arrays have lots of member methods that you can invoke on the array. So I can ask, uh, call min, and that gets the, um, the minimum value along a particular axis. Um, and by default, so, so notice all of these parameters, it's a, they say equal, that means that they all, all of these have a default value. That's why I didn't have to specify any particular parameter, right? It's just a little bit about calling functions um, in Python. Although lots of languages use these sort of named parameters and have this idea of default parameters. So again, you could do default parameters in C and Java, C++. But by default, if you don't specify any parameter, um, it'll give you the, the minimum among all axes, which is one here. But if I want the minimum along the zeroth axis, and the zeroth axis in this case is the rows, uh, I think if, if I got this right, um, it, it'll give me the, the three values. So the minimum around, among row zero, row one, and row two. Or did I have that backwards? No, nope. um, I only got two values, one, four. Um, Oh, that's probably because, again, you know, I, I got to be, I probably define A later on here. So, again, um, I ran into that problem. You know, let me um, restart and clear all outputs and uh, run all the cells up to this point. Let's try that again. So uh, yeah, I had it backwards. So when you ask for axis zero, um, it's basically giving me the the um, um, the, the minimum in each column here, right? So why is that axis zero? And, and, and I to remember. So I so anyway, so, so, you know, so we got the minimum in this column, the minimum in this column. So presumably, if I ask for axis one, I get the 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 minimum uh, the um, the rows here. So that should be the minimum of that row, the minimum of that row is two, and the minimum of that row is also two. Right. Well, anyway, I mean, you know, the point is, um, oh, I think, yeah, I had some talk about that. Um, the point is, is that, you know, these are objects that are returned, um, and uh, these have member functions, and you can, you can find the NumPy documentation, which 
Uh, actually, I, maybe I have right there. Um, if you want to look for the, the the reference documentation for all the the, the different um, member functions for NumPy arrays that, that are available. So, um, so you know, you can do things like sum up all the values in the array. Can reshape them so as long as the, the the total number of values matches so i have um, um 18 values in here so i can reshape it to anything that has a total of 18 values so reshape it into a um, six by three so from three by six to six by three um notice that when we did that that the five four five ended up here uh, and then these got reshaped three four one into the next row and so on so it's going to keep the ordering of the items. So I can reshape them to three dimensional. Right. Um, so none of those actually modifies the array A itself. Okay, so it returns a new array. Okay, so notice the, the array was still three by six. Uh, a, if, 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 if I don't know anything. So, I mean, if I wanted to, I could make an array B um, that's a view into it of that shape. And our B is always going to be a two by three by three, whereas A is a different variable um, with the shape uh, three by six, three rows by six. All right, um, now the, probably the most important thing for this class you should understand about arrays is they support uh, what's known as vectorized operations or vectorized programming. So that's kind of a fancy name for mean, mean that I can treat the array kind of like the way you treat a regular variable, um, so what some people call a scalar variable. Okay, so in most programming languages that you use, probably unless you have done stuff with MATLAB or with, with Python with NumPy, when you create a variable in the language, it holds a single value. So that's known as a scalar value. And then if you do operations on variables in your programming language, you're doing scalar operations. So they're, they're operations between two single values at a time. Okay. Now, in a language that supports the so-called vectorized programming or vectorized operations, I can kind of treat A like, like, a, like, like I would a scalar value in, in a different language. Um, so I can write expressions with it, and it will perform the operation um, on all the values in the array. Um, all right. So, you know, an example might make that easier to understand than just trying to describe that. So if I do like a equals one, so in, in, a, in a language that doesn't support this kind of vectorized programming, if I wanted to know, you know, whether each value was equal to one or not, you know, get a Boolean result, like true or false, I would have to write a loop or maybe even a nested loop in order to handle the two dimensional, you know, so an outer loop that goes over the column, the, the rows maybe, and, and an inner loop that goes over the columns, and then access each item um, and test it whether it's equal to one or not. To get my result. So, but, but here, you know, I, I don't have to do any of that writing explicit loops to all, do all that, all that. So I can just say A equals one, and it will perform that operation on all of the values in the array and return a result that's of the same shape as the array that I performed the vectorized operation on. So, so doing a Boolean test of whether each value is equal to one or not. We only had one value that was equal to one, that one over here, and everything else was false. Right? So pretty much any Boolean operation will work, right? Um, so, um, and you can combine these kind of logical things. I'm probably going to skip over that, so, so you, you'll need some of this later on. But um, you know, uh, you should look at that for some ideas about writing Boolean expressions with arrays. Um, and um, I guess, oh, um, 
I guess later on we talk more about vectorized operations uh, in this um, in this notebook. Was that a different notebook that I'm thinking? Of? I can't remember. So um, I mean, there, there's more to this here. So. Um, Um, just a second, I'm trying to remember. Okay, it must be a, a different, must be a, a, another notebook where I go into more detail on that. So, so let, 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 let's just kind of. Um, um, move on. So we'll come back to some more things about vectorized operations on NumPy arrays now. Um, so um, you can slice arrays. So another important thing to be comfortable with is slicing NumPy arrays. So the, the syntax here looks similar to slicing on on, pi, on regular plain lists. Okay, but you can, uh, since, since the array is multiple, so a list really is only one dimensional. Um, but a uh, uh, NumPy array can be multiple dimensional, so you can provide slices for each dimension, um, as, as, as we go in this notebook here. So, um, of course, you know, again, you can index. So, so if I have a one dimensional array like this, I can get a particular item at, at, at a particular index, so the item at index two. Or I can slice it on my one um, my, my one dimension. So this gets the items on my only dimension for this array A uh, from index two up to, but not including five. So that's going to be two, three, and four here. Um, that you said it slices out. I didn't mention this before for lists, but you can actually provide like a, a negative step size to actually. Um, index in reverse, so this will this will uh, um, actually pull out all the items in reverse. Although that's that there's there's a reverse function, so you normally wouldn't do that. You just I think there's a reverse function. Well, I could be wrong. So I have to look that up in the um, member reference for NumPy arrays. So. Um, So I wanted to skip over to looking at multidimensional slicing. So if um, if I have a two-dimensional array, so, so don't worry about this. Or you know, when you read the notebook, you can figure out the details of that. But um, so, so B is like a two-dimensional array with these values um, in it. So um, I can, like for the one-dimensional case, I can index one value by specifying a particular index on each dimension. Right? Um, so if I want the value at, at uh, row two, column three, that's going to be, uh, again, zero indexing, so zero, one, two. So row two is this one, and column three is zero, one, two, three. So that's the value right there. That's, that's row two, column three. Um, or uh, row three, um, column one. And by the way, I mean, this extends to you know, three-dimensional or higher dimensional, right? So if I have three dimensions, I just have to provide three indexes um, to specify a single value somewhere in the three-dimensional array. But um, um, you know, as we already saw, you can use slicing. And when you have a multi-dimensional array, you can combine slicing and indexing um, in pretty much any way that you can think of. 
So, so here um, I'm getting all rows, so there's five rows, but I'm only getting the, the, the column one, right? So it's gonna be all, all, all rows, but just the values in column one for those rows. So we end up with a single dimensional slice, uh, which is column one, basically, of this um, array. Right? And again, you know, as I mentioned, since uh, by default, it uses the, the first and the last uh, index, if I didn't specify zero and five, I could have got the same result uh, to get all of the values in that column one. Um, my first slice. So that, this is a common idiom for NumPy arrays and NumPy array-like things. If I want column, if I want a particular column, I do, you know, the, all the values in some particular column. Likewise, I can get particular rows. So, so if I want all the, 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 the values uh, in rows two through four, this is going to be two, row two and three, up to but not including four. So again, you know, make certain you understand the slicing notation. So it, it starts at the first index and it goes up to but doesn't include the last index. So this will end up being uh, rows two and three. This one and this one. Well, by the way, so um, if I want a particular column, I have to, um, for, for a two-dimensional array, I, I have to, but, but I want all the values in that column, I have to specify like, um, you know, the colon or, or, or which uh, rows or, or the, the empty colon if I want all the rows. But um, if, you, if, if, if I have two or higher dimensional array, um, And um, like I just did here, um, and if I want all of the, the, the columns in rows two and three, um, you don't have, again, by default, if you don't specify those indexes, it's gonna, uh, it's gonna assume that you want all of them. I mean, so in this case, it's gonna get, uh, again, all the values in all columns for rows two and four. So this is equivalent to the one that we just did there. But this is very common for us in, when we, use NumPy arrays and data frames um, that are often two dimensional. So we might only want some particular columns. So, so you know, if you just specify that, or sorry, some, some particular rows. So here, if I only want uh, these rows uh, of data, then I can pull them out um, by doing that. And, and, and you know, likewise, if I only want one particular row, I can just specify the particular row number. So if I want just row zero, I can specify. That gives me all the values in rows here on there. All right. Um, so anyway, I mean, that's I think that's kind of the most important kind of concepts here. So so you know, NumPy arrays are important and and um, um, Especially make certain that you understand um, kind of the, the powerful indexing and slicing uh, that can be done, because we're gonna, we're, you're going to see a lot a, a lot of code makes use of this kind of slicing of NumPy arrays, uh, or other, there's other objects that we're going to be using a lot, uh, especially data frames, which is the um, um, it, which um, is talked about in the third video here for this unit. So data frames also work like NumPy arrays. So you can do similar kinds of slicing of rows and columns for uh, pandas data frames. All right. Um, um, yeah. So I don't know. I I don't know how I missed skipping over that. So so I, I did want to not move on from NumPy until I got back and talked a little bit about 
vectorized competition. So I started talking about this. It's another thing that, that um, you ought to understand uh, because when we talk about implementing um, some of these machine learning algorithms sort of by hand, um, um, it's good to have a basic grasp of what we mean by vectorized computing. Um, or doing this style of programming in a vectorized way. Okay? So um, um, again, you know, at its most basic, uh, we can treat NumPy arrays kind of as if they were scalar. So we can do, basically we can write expressions using variables that are actually NumPy arrays instead of var a variable holding a single scalar value. And NumPy will um, perform the operation that's indicated on all the values. All right? So if I have this uh, what, 10 by 10 array of random integers, um, I can do like an expression like a minus 10. Now we'll subtract 10 from every value. So, so basically it's, it's, it's performing the subtraction operation simultaneously on all values of this array. And thus we get the result. And by the way, I mean, another reason why this is important is because these vectorized operations turn out to be able to be implemented much more efficiently than writing a loop. So, so I, you know, you could get the same result by writing a, a Python loop to loop through each individual item and do the subtraction, but that code would, would run 10 to 100 times slower than the implementation of performing it using a vectorized operation on NumPy. So again, the performance is very important here. So we prefer, highly prefer to write vectorized code rather than having explicit loops um, to perform operations on values in NumPy arrays. So in any, any basic operations, we can multiply all the values. Um, oops. Um, multiply the values like multiply by 10. Like I said, all these things run before. So um, divide by 10, so on. Um, and um, most all, uh, all of the functions in NumPy um, that, that take a value's input are going to, are, are what are known as vectorized functions. So they expect parameters to come in that are NumPy arrays, right? And then they will perform their operation um, in a vectorized way again, over all the values in the array. So, so you know, we can't use, uh, I think maybe I showed that, or maybe I showed it in the video. So, so you know, you can't use, um, the standard math library say to, to get the, the sign of the values in B here because the, 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 the math libraries expect um, scalar values so they, they can't handle numpy arrays they, they're not vectorized if you pass that in you'll get some kind of, of a, um, an error if you try to do that so instead you know so, so basically the basic numpy library provides um, pretty much all the standard mathematical functions that you find in the math library, but they're all vectorized. Sines, cosines, logs, exponentials, um, all that kind of stuff. All right. Um, but, so, so you might get the impression then that um, um, like when I do a vectorized operation, it's always like between an array and a single value. And, and basically all we're doing is like looping or broadcasting that operation to be performed on every value in the array. But that's not the case. So, so um, 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 it also works on expressions between arrays and other arrays to, to do vectorized operations. So in this case, as long as the arrays are of the same shape and size, actually, I think if they're just of the same size, so, so you can actually broadcast or do things correctly, even if their shapes are slightly different. So it'll interpret that the, the way that you would expect. But anyway, if I have two, vectors, two one-dimensional arrays, four values, um, I can add them together and they would do what you kind of expect. They add corresponding elements. Um, so I get a resulting array, which is just the addition of all those, fraction, and so on. Um, just as a side note, um, 
multiplication or the star operation is doing element wise multiplication. So um, anybody who has a mathematical background might on first blush think that this is going to do matrix multiplication instead of element wise multiplication. But yeah, the star does element wise vectorized multiplication. Uh, there is, this is kind of new in Python 3, I believe. Uh, they added in, you can use the, the at, like the email at sign, if you really want to do mathematical matrix multiplication. Um, and that's really, I think that's just kind of a, it, it, behind the scenes it calls the, the dot function. So the dot product is, is um, matrix multiplication. So another name for matrix multiplication is the dot product of two arrays. So. Um, but then here is kind of the um, the, the money shot, the um, uh, uh, where this all leads up to the, the power of the vectorized programming. So let's say we have an array um, that um, is uh, it's a one-dimensional array. So limb space creates an array of values from negative four up to four. It creates an array of a thousand values. Let me call this. So if you look at the values um, in X. After calling that, let's look at just the first 10 values using a slice. Yeah. Right. So basically, it created an array of a thousand values and started at negative four. And then, you know, it figured out what the step size was to get exactly a thousand values. And so, so the next value was basically negative 3.99, so on, up to four. Right. So it's basically just a one mesh array. So notice, I'm using that x in this expression here, and then this is an example of what looks like just a regular um, um, scalar expression, but I, I'm using NumPy arrays in here. But because all these operations are vectorized, um, it, it calculates all these things. So you know, so again, by order of precedence, um, you know, it, it would first raise all the values, cube all the values. For x, perform that, and then after that, you know, it would do like the multiplications first. So it would just do 50 times. Oh, sorry, um, it would do the, the square of that one. But it, when we take the cube, it returns an array of the same size, but just with the cube of the values here. Same for the square, and then you know, it returns a square of the values. It takes the sign of all those, but the sign function returns an array again with that same shape of a thousand, and so on. The, the same. The, the same can be said for all of these. The result is going to be an array, but that has gone been, um, uh, of the same shape as x, but we have put through this mathematical function, you know, 50 times the sine of, that, of, of the square of the x value plus 1 half times the cube of x minus 10 times the cosine. Right? So you get a kind of a complex, if you plot those, and we'll talk about that in the next um, um, lecture notebook here. So we plot those, you get a nice kind of wiggly function, which is a combination of the sines and the cosines and the cube of the, the function. All right. So it is important to understand why that's, you know, so you can't do this in a language that doesn't support vectorized operations. So to do the same thing in C, you have to have a loop that iterates over a thousand times performs this calculation on each individual value of x as input, putting them into a new array y, before then you can send your x and y to be plotted in some plotting function or something like that. All right. Um, questions about the NumPy? I think finally that was everything I was wanted to kind of I think I'm going to speed through Matplotlib and pandas. Um, um, you will have to do some plotting, but for the most part, probably some. You mostly just need some basic line plots here and there, right? But this, this is a good thing, um, um, you know, to go through. So um, I give kind of an example of using the Matplotlib library in detail. So Matplotlib um, is a library for uh, plotting values. Uh, it can plot 
regular Python lists um, of numbers, or it can plot, num you can give it NumPy arrays or any list-like item or sequence-like item um, to plot things. So it was, I already showed you a plot in the previous one. So the most basic example of a plot, I guess I gotta run this here. Uh, again, back to like sine and cosine. Oh, um, should probably have that uncommented out. Maybe I'll talk about that real quickly here. But um, I don't, I don't want to use the Matplotlib widget. Um, I know it's, it's, uh, it's good to be able to recognize when things are still, when the uh, the kernel is still running or not. So you can kind of see this flickering. You'll see this kind of Noting it's busy, so it's actually still because um, um, I did a run all, so it's still running some of these cells down here. It hadn't completed off here um, somewhere, so I'm going to stop that. You can stop your running kernel. You should be able to interrupt it. It's not interrupting there for some reason. There we go. I think I finally stopped it. I'm going to um, restart and clear all outputs. And then let's restart it here. So, um, so yeah, I mean, yeah, I just wanted to show a basic plot, you know, like we have here. So again, this is the kind of the same as we did before, but much simpler. So, you know, if we create an array X, which is just a one dimensional array that ranges from negative pi up to pi using np.pi constant. And this gives me 256 values. So it splits into 256 points evenly from negative pi up to pi. And then I use a vectorized calculation to calculate the sign for each of those x points to get, get what the sign of the value is. So, so the basic use of plot, the matplotlib plotting function is you pass in uh, you know, so, so the, the, the most basic plots we do are just two-dimensional plots. So you, you plot in a set of X values, uh, pass in a set of X values, and then a corresponding set of the Y values, the Y location. Uh, these have to be of the same size. And, the, and, and again, these could be sequence, these could be lists um, or any, anything that's kind of like a sequence-like. Um, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's all you need for a basic plot. And, and there we have the sign, the plot of the sign from negative pi to pi. All right, so there's, there's you know, lots of features that you can use to create um, very nice looking um, plot plots. So that, that was what the section three was about. Um, um, you, know, you probably don't have to go through in this de in detail right now, but maybe later on, if you wanted to, to, to make your plots look nicer, you can maybe come back um, and look at that. And again, also, this is more kind of for reference. So this, this whole one might be for reference. and. Is, is easily um, uh, for the moment right now, uh, as long as you can do like a basic plot, um, I believe, let's look at the assignment here. Let's you can do a basic plot um, and understand what a basic plot using Matplotlib is doing. Um, you'll be able to get started. But we have some examples of, of things you can do with basic Matplotlib plotting, some bar plots, um, histograms, um, scatter plots. Um, adding elements, so a scatter plot with a line plot um, where we fit. And so, by the way, you know, this is basically what we're going to be doing our first machine learning um, algorithm, which some people would argue isn't really machine learning, um, it's from basic statistics. So, so you know, we're going to learn about linear regression and, and fitting a linear model to a set of data points. Um, Some examples of Kantian and 3D plots. Um, one of the extensions that, if you're using my dev box and if it got installed correctly, um, is some uh, more advanced um, plotting um, uh, widget. So, if you want to, you can use this, what's known as Python magic, to use the matplotlib widget. Uh, instead, um, I have to rerun everything though. And I don't normally use that for just regular figures, but it allows you to um, 
Um, do things like a, a zoom in and out on the figure um, and, and kind of pan it around. And, um, and we can zoom in and, and I can't remember how you zoom back out now. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. Oh yeah, where you can get you can remove all the stuff you've done and go back to the original plot. Um, I find this most useful for like uh, three-dimensional um, objects, three-dimensional plots. So really, if you um, use that, you can more easily kind of rotate it around and um, get a better feel for a, a three-dimensional shape. Um, yeah, when we, when we talk about um, the basic side, basic idea of a um, fitness landscape. Um, and um, um, optimizing to find the um, um, best fit parameters. We do a few kind of three-dimensional plots where it might, might be useful to be able to kind of look around at them like this. So. Um, still running, I guess. I'll let it run. Um, and then finally, also, like I said, well, um, there is also, I, I forgot, there is a, a fourth uh, notebook, but not a fourth lecture. Um, so this is kind of um, optional, the fourth one, um, at least for right now. Uh, Pandas, um, for the first assignment, you won't need too much Pandas. Well, that's not true. So part of, of the first assignment, I do explicitly have you uh, do some Pandas stuff. So. Um, so usually, instead of NumPy arrays, we, we mostly, when we're doing data analytics, uh, we use pandas. Pandas basically provides um, um, Let me stop that kernel just a second. Um, And for some reason, my um, my um, my outline is not uh, updating. There it goes. Try it again. Not certain. I'll have to look at that later. Okay. Um, so, Pandas provides um, um, provides a series, but but um, um, uh, the main one that we'll use is a data frame. Data frame is really uh, a collection of uh, of series. Um, so, where each series uh, is is going to be a row. Um, so, a a data frame um, is kind of like a NumPy array. But it provides a two-dimensional basic data uh, uh, table where the, the, the data um, is laid out in rows and columns. Um, now, and, and the, the data can be of different types. So, you know, um, our first column here um, is a um, integer or a floating point number. Second column is a date. Um, so, so the data is not homogeneous, but each column has to be of the same type. So that, that's a restriction of the data frame because that, that's the way that most data analytics, when we have a, a table of data, that's the way it works, is that each column represents some feature. So we always lay out a two-dimensional uh, data table where the rows are um, samples or they are um, um, some data points or they are... Um, um, like a subject, an experiment, and then the columns represent the, the data collected for each one of those samples. Uh, 
um, or, for, or for each one of those subjects. So each row usually represents the running of one experiment or the, um, the gathering of data for one, um, um, from, for one item. And then the columns were the different features that, that we gathered for that, that, um, that sample or whatever, all right? Um, so in some way, um, um, data frames are also kind of like a dictionary because um, you can refer reference each one of the columns. You can, you can think of, the, uh, of each column as a, as, as a feature of the data set. And you can reference the columns by name instead of by an index, all right? So that, that's kind of the, the main thing that we do with um, uh, Python data frames. So this is a completely made up data frame here. So all the columns just have names ABC or all the feature, feature names are ABC through Z, I guess. Um, So for example, if I want to get just the feature named F, I can use dot, so, so dot, and then the name of the column or the name of the feature will, will pull out one feature from a data frame. Um, and, uh, and, and, and other things here. So um, I guess I didn't rerun this here. Oh, there, I got my, got my outline back finally. So, um, so uh, and there's there's multiple ways to um, access uh, a column or a feature. So another way is you can use square bracket brackets, brackets kind of like your um, um, no open GC. Kind of like your um, open just a common look. I want a question. Let me know, or, or else mute your microphone. So yeah. Um, so, so those are kind of like doing an index into like a dictionary, so you can get the name of a column or the name of a feature to pull out the column um, or the dot notation. Um, and uh, you can get multiple columns. You can't really use the dot because the dot is only to get one particular feature. So if I if I need multiple features. I can pass in a list of, of feature names and pull out. So the, the result is a new data frame uh, just with those columns, and, you know, those features in it. Um, you can actually also get columns and rows by index. So, so there are different um, member functions for pulling out things uh, by index instead of by name. So that's usually the iloc or i something or other. So, um, although it's usually a good idea to try to avoid using numeric indexes. So, I mean, data frames are really structured around the idea that columns have names and features have names. Um, and you should normally be trying to access uh, features um, by, by their names and maybe pulling out the rows, which are samples um, by some other criteria. So, um, All right, and, and I think I'm going to go ahead and, um, um, you know, so you'll have to, to, to work through this notebook. Um, um, but yeah, the most important things are the basics, you know, so, so selecting the data, um, um, maybe adding new columns in, so adding new features into the, to your data frame and things like that. All right, so yeah, I'm kind of just wrapping that up because I, I did want to also pull up the assignment. See if anybody had questions on that. So let's, let's look at the assignment. So um, all the assignments should be, sorry, just a second. So all the assignments should be, um, um, up at the top level, 
in in our class repository. Uh, although you shouldn't get started on like assignment two yet. So 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 anyone past assignment one might change. So just kind of as a warning, um, uh, don't don't start on assignment two till I kind of tell you that it's ready. So. Um, So there's four problems in assignment one. Um, one to write like a, some basic Python functions, one to do um, some things with NumPy, uh, one specifically about NumPy vectorized, writing vectorized functions, um, oh, and some plotting, and then one for pandas, right? So the functions, I hope, are a little bit warm up, although, you know, again, I'm, I'm assuming that you can write functions. So, um, um, uh, you know, if you haven't done stuff in Python, but, you know, um, that if, if I give you a specification of a function that you can write it, you know, write the implementation, the algorithm to solve that problem. So, um, so the way you're going to be doing these is, um, I actually gave you um, an implementation of writing the, uh, you know, calculating the nth Fibonacci number. Um, so this is an example of what we mean by, you know, so, so the, um, the first and second Fibonacci number are one and two by this definition here. Um, and then, you know, the, the, the third Fibonacci, so, so these are kind of the, the, the base cases, right? So this, Fibonacci sequences are, aren't always defined this way. So sometimes they're defined with the base cases as one and one. Uh, and then in that case, the third one would be two. Um, so, 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 but the way we're doing it is that the, the base case one and two are one and two. So then the third one is just the sum of the previous two. So that's three. And then the fourth one is the sum of three and two, five, seven, and so on. So that's where the third and the fourth come from. Um, so I ask you to write an efficient version of this using uh, memoization techniques. Right? So, so it's described in here. Um, so what you want to do is instead of recursive, so this is an example of a recursive function, um, and this is a very inefficient recursive function because it is call, it's, it's calling itself recursively twice. So it's recalculating a lot of the, the, the Fibonacci numbers by, by, by doing this you know, exponentially expanding tree of recursive calls here. So it's going to take a very long time to, to um, call these things. So I'm asking you to um, not, not write um, an iterative version, but to use memoization. So to basically implement this using a dictionary. So if, if I ask for like the 10th Fibonacci number, we, we first look up in the dictionary to see if it's already been calculated. If it's already been calculated, you just access it out of the dictionary and, and return your results. But if it hasn't been calculated yet, um, you need to calculate it by recursively. So, so you should should still be calling the Fibonacci um, efficient function recursively inside of your implementation here. Um, just um, um, uh, first using the, what's known as a memoization dictionary um, to shortcut doing the recursion. You know, check if you've already calculated the, the, uh, the particular value that you need right now. So yeah, so that was all. The, the first problem was was writing the Fibonacci um, efficient. So what it'll take, what you need to do. If it's not clear, is um, I've actually got the um, um, actually also gave you the um, in the um, markdown cell. I gave you the the um, signature of the function you're supposed to write, uh, and, and even the function documentation. So you can like copy that function documentation out of there. Um, 
to get you started. I'm going to write your implementation in this cell here where it says. And also. So we'll need the implementation of the Fibonacci efficient function um, in this cell. And you might want to do your test here. Um, we'll probably use the same test that we had here, um, just as a quick one. Um, if you get you know, one, two, three, four right, 10 right, maybe some others. Um, the second problem is um, um, you don't have to write a function. You just have to write what's described for each one of these cells using NumPy. So um, um, this is kind of important because we reuse these operations for the third problem here. So um, you know, just 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 write these as is talked about. And I think usually I give you what should be the result if you do it correctly. So you have to start by creating uh, a one-dimensional array named X. Um, uh, which is actually, um, you, want it, you want it to be, the result to be a, um, one dimensional um, row array here. So we got one row and five columns. Um, in this case, so kind of as a hint here, um, um, it, it would also be better instead of just hard coding these values that I ask you to get in here as a list, uh, start by using a um, uh, and I'll just give it to you. Start by using um, an array creation function instead. So something like um, um, a range. We'll get you the values from negative two up to two, uh, up to three, but not including three. So the default is to step by one. Um, if you don't specify the, uh, the step size, yeah. So, um, but this is not quite the same here. So this is um, um, uh, not what was asked for. Um, because in this case, this is a one dimensional array, but I want, um, um, actually, actually what I want is a two dimensional array that has shape one by five. So, so if you look at the shape of this, It's a one-dimensional array with five values. So, so the, the, what this means here is that the shape should be one comma five. It really should be two-dimensional, a, a, a row matrix with one row and five columns, so a one comma five or one by five matrix here. Likewise, so you need Y here. Um, and um, it should be, um, um, The, the, when I said linearly spaced here, I, I guess that I meant that to be kind of a hint that uh, to use like the lin space. So you can also get uh, the, the same kind of result using lin space instead of a range by specifying the, the, the step size correctly or by specifying that I want exactly five values. So if I want to go from negative two to stop at two and I want exactly five values in the array. Um, It gets you exactly what you want. Same thing, um, kind of you can do that here. So if I want if linear, if you do use lin space to get it from negative one to one, uh, but I want exactly four values, that'll get you exactly what you need uh, here. Except you might have to reshape it to get it into um, the shape of one column by four rows, and so on for these, right?
the ways would get pro progressively uh, um, tougher, but but they each um, need to use the previous result um, um, for each step of the way here to build up the array that's um, described here. Okay. Um, So then in this third one, you're going to be basically using these operations that we described in problem two to write a function because these operations, if, if you do them in this order, um, will, uh, and if we iterate over these as, as we described here, we'll calculate this Julia set. You'll get these really kind of nice plots, okay? So, um, 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 so yeah, I, I mean, you're actually not going to be doing the plotting. Um, so I take the result from your function to calculate the Julia set, and then I plot it. And the result, if, if you do the function correctly, is, is you'll get a plot that looks exactly like this, um, the Julia set for these particular values, right? So, um, so you have to do, you have to, to, to write your function here. So again, you know, I, I gave you the signature for the function. So you can start uh, with that signature. So, so you, you do these steps. So you, you start by making a copy of the Z array that's passed in um, that you're going to be using to, to do the updates here, right? Um, so you want to initialize C, M, and T based on the shape of Z um, as you did for the uh, in in, in the problem two here, right? So, um, so, so we're going to be using C M and T kind of like you you had to use them up here, um, but um, but this is just creating the initial ones here. So all of these, C, M, and T, should all be of the same shape as Z, right? But, but C uh, should be initialized um, uh, to have the sh same shape as Z, but, uh, um, but all of the values, are gonna, it's going to be filled in with a repetition of all these initial values C that you get as the third parameter um, for the function. Um, so, so they're all complex numbers um, in uh, C. Um, uh, M, again, should be the same shape as Z. Um, So initially, um, all the values, and so, so M should just be an array of Booleans. Um, but um, initially, all of, uh, of the same shape as Z, and initially, all of its values are um, true, um, like we started with um, previously here. Right. So whatever shape Z is, so here, you know, the shape is what? Um, four rows by five columns, as you did in problem two. So you need to create, initialize an M, that's whatever the shape is that you're given for Z, but, but that's initially all the values are true in it, like you have to do here. Um, And then, like, and then T um, is is an array of the sh same shape as Z, and but it's initially just it's an array of integers, and initially all of its values should be zero. So that's that's kind of the easiest one. So, you, for example, you can use the in NumPy dot zeros function. So the, the the zeros function from the NumPy library creates arrays of some particular shape um, filled all with zeros, just as an example. Um, 
right? And then, I mean, the real work, so that's just making a copy and initializing some things. So you have to create a loop that's basically going to be doing these steps that you do, that you do one of up here. Um, so the loop should, should, should be like a for loop that iterates um, like two, number of iteration times. So by default, it should iterate 256 times. So you could use like a for loop that iterates from zero, like, like uses like a range statement to iterate from zero to 256. Um, and, and it should perform those three updates um, that, that we did for the previous problem. Um, so so e, Z is gonna be updated to be uh, Z squared plus C, but only for those values where the matrix M is true, which is one of the things that you did you have to do in the previous step. Then you need to update the mask M. Um, and then finally, um, you want to update T to mark any values um, where that mask is uh, has become false uh, with the current timestamp. And what I mean by timestamp here is just the, the index for the loop, right? So, so the loop, if it's executing 256 times, the first time in the loop, uh, the, 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 the timestamp is zero. And the second time it's one, the third time it's, it's two, and then so forth. And at the end, you're just re returning this, those time stamps key. And that's what we actually plot here. So, so this is kind of a heat map of when uh, these points dropped out of the Julia set. And if we plot it the way that we do, uh, this uh, time stamp should get these pretty pictures of the Julia set here. All right. So if you have your function here implemented correctly, if you run these cells, uh, you'll recreate the figure of the Julia set. Um, and then finally, um, um, these, these will probably be a little bit easier than the problem two and three, I think. So um, uh, although it is with, with with using pandas. So there's a um, data file um, um, that's in comma separated value format. Um, um, and this should be in the data directory. So uh, again, if you go back and look at the file browser, you have to go up one level, go into to data, um, and then there should be the um, assignment one data.csv, right? So this just has 15 rows um, and, and these different columns. It's kind of like a, a data set of um, some like sales data for a, for a, a made-up company or something like that. And then you know just do the tasks that are asked for using that data thing, data frame. So load it into a bit a pandas data frame, um, display the first five uh, samples, the, the first five uh, rows from the data frame. Add a new column, uh, which is a total of their January, February, and March um, sales, um, and um, so on. All right. All right, so that was that was relatively quick, but that's kind of the um, the um, the four problems that you're supposed to be doing for the assignment one. And we ought to get working on that as soon as you can. Um, and any questions about that from those that are still here that people wanted to ask about? Um, I mean, people can always send me um, questions by email. Um, if you haven't started working on these yet, um, you know, if you're, I'm sure people will run into questions trying to implement um, um, these four questions here, these four uh, tasks that you have to do.
All right. I'm going to go ahead and end the session then, unless anybody kind of wants to throw out a quick question. Um, I'll post this as usual. Uh, well, not as usual, but I'll, I'll get a, a, a playlist created and post this video for anybody that wasn't able to watch interactively. Uh, otherwise, have a good night. Um, send questions if you have them. You know, make certain you get your dev box up if you're still working on that. It really needs to be up before now. So, all right, and I will see you guys later then.